Our service so far is truly Jamaican. Don't you like it? Ah, good. Now, we have a message with a difference. Please help me welcome Reverend Michael and practitioner Carol Campbell this morning. Thank you for that introduction, Reverend Anne. And good morning, all. Good morning. A blessed morning to you here at the Temple of Light on this light-filled morning and in sunny, sunny Kingston, Jamaica. And to you listening online. And a special good morning to you, Science of Mind practitioner, Carol Campbell. I ask you here to join me on the platform as I need your help with my talk this morning. Why, you haven't written it yet, Michael? It's not one of my regular talks. Oh. <laughs> it's to be in the form of a dialogue. I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> in one of those deep introspective communings with your higher self, I suppose. No, it's an exploratory talk with you. I see. <laughs> What exactly are we exploring? <laughs> we are exploring the connection between quantum physics and Jesus' teaching. What, what do I know about quantum physics? I'm an artist. You are also a religious science practitioner with years of training and experience. So you know a lot about Jesus too. Well, what I don't remember, I can look it up. I have a Bible. Right here. Don't strain yourself. <laughs> That's a large Bible. <laughs> and, and Carol, I've been learning about quantum physics. You see, I just finished teaching a, a course on it last week. You saw a link between Jesus and quantum physics? Jesus lived 2,000 odd years ago. And I know that quantum physics was discovered very recently. True, in the last 100 years. So Jesus couldn't possibly know about quantum physics. Not by name, not by name. But he knew truths about the universe that apparently quantum physics are just, physicists are just discovering. Oh, tell me more. Okay. There are five quantum physics discoveries mentioned in Shortcut to a Miracle. That's the textbook that my class used. The first one is, Quantum physics shows that the universe is an undivided whole. Everything is connected. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Everything doesn't look connected. Those trees outside are not connected. They're far from one another. They're connected by the land that they're planted in. Okay. But people are not planted. They're walking about on the land, unconnected. True, I give you that. But have you heard about telepathy? Mind reading? Yes. Well, hundreds, hundreds of scientifically controlled experiments have shown that telepathy is possible. That means human beings are connected mentally, I mean by thought. That's why sometimes, and you, you would have experienced this, sometimes when you think about somebody, the phone rings, and lo and behold, it's them. Hmm. <laughs> now I think about it, yes. And humans and animals, at least domestic animals like cats and dogs and horses, are mentally connected too. They can sense our emotions and intentions. Exactly. And, and I'm sure that a lot of animal hope Owners can testify to that. So what does, does Jesus have anything to say on the matter? You have the Bible. Hmm. Well, let, let's see. Well, he says we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Right. And we are our brother's keeper. Correct. That's sort of a connection. 
And it's illustrated by the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Remember it? I certainly do. I certainly do. A lawyer asked Jesus, who is his neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And as likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at the man and passed by again on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw the wounded man, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> wow. Well, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> I was going to say that Jesus saying we should love is one thing, but not everybody loves others. True. Does Jesus ever demonstrate that we are actually mentally connected? Actually, I mean, like telepathically. Well, remember there are stories in the Bible showing he heals people. By touching them, yes. Like the two blind men in Matthew 9, I remember. But also at a distance by just speaking his word. Like the centurion servant in Luke Gospel chapter 7. Jesus was in Capernaum and a Roman centurion who had heard about Jesus sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his sick servant. The elders begged him earnestly, saying that the centurion was deserving and loved the Jews and actually built them a synagogue. Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the censurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. I do not even think myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard these things, he marveled and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith not even in Israel. And when those who were sent returned to the house, they found the servant already healed. I remember the story. And remember, he called Lazarus from the dead. But coming to think about it, he was close to the tomb. When John, because John tells us the tomb was a cave with a stone across the mouth. And Jesus came there. And so Jesus was within shouting distance. Except that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Right. And presumably further away than the centurion servant. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. I, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But you know, even if those things never literally happened, as stories, they show that from that time, 2,000 odd years ago, People believe human beings were connected mentally, which is what quantum physics is showing now. Hmm. And, right. and 
Additionally, quantum physics is showing how it could work. Really? I can't wait to hear. <laughs> you know that for hundreds of years, atoms were thought to be the smallest form of matter, right? Yeah. Well, quantum physics deals with things which are tinier, smaller than atoms, subatomic particles, they call them. And scientific laboratory tests show that our minds influence things at that level. But why? Now, I said that subatomic things were particles. But sometimes those particles, which could be like, think of very tiny marbles. Sometimes those particles become waves. So if they are waves, you can see that our brain waves could link with them. Both are forms of energy. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Sometimes subatomic particles change from being like marbles to being like waves. So brain waves, light waves, gravitational waves, heat waves. Correct. What causes them to change to waves? The quantum experiments, repeatable experiments, mind you, show that the intentions, the intentions of the experimenters cause the change. <laughs> they know our intentions? That is what the experiments show. The particles will start out as particles because the experimenters have the intention to measure them as particles. And if the experimenters change their mind suddenly in the middle of the experiment, get this, and want to measure them as waves, they change to waves to suit the experimenters. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that means that quantum physics proves in repeatable experiments that the universe responds positively to our thoughts. That's right. Hmm. Reminds me of the beginning of Genesis when God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, that was God speaking. So don't you see that quantum physics is showing that we are like God? We can create things in our environment with our intentions just as God does. You're correct. And that is what science of mind also teaches. So, quantum physics is catching up with science of mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> as well as Jesus, exactly. <laughs> but to get to catching up with Jesus as he influences things in his environment, here, hmm, in John chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, we read about Jesus' first miracle, changing water into wine. Remember it well. <laughs> and here it goes. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. So Jesus tells some servants to fill the water pots with water, after which he told them to take the contents to the governor of the feast. And when the man had tasted the water that was made wine without him knowing where it came from, he called the bridegroom and famously said, and I quote, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, mm, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine till now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the story, by the way, also tells us that Jesus had nothing against wine. Point. <laughs> <laughs> and in Mark chapter 4, we read about him calming the storm. And it goes like this. Jesus and his disciples were in a boat, and Jesus was sleeping when a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, nearly swamping it. The disciples woke Jesus and said to him, Teacher, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus promptly got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down. 
and it was completely calm. Mark reports that the disciples were terrified and asked one another, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him? What kind of man is this? Mm -hmm. Then there was a rather odd story of Jesus cursing a fig tree in Bethany because it had no fruit when he was hungry. The next day, the disciples saw that it was withered from the root. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. I remember it. And, you know, it is in Jesus' answer that we re realize the lesson he wanted the disciples to learn. It's a really important one. Well, let me read it. Mm -hmm. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. As I said, a really important lesson about prayer. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours, unquote. Those who didn't believe Jesus about the importance of, of having absolute faith in one's ability to bring about even major changes can believe quantum physics, those experiments are repeatable. You can move mountains because your thoughts influence the atoms in the mountains. That's what quantum physics teaches experimentally. But Carol, I've saved for the last the most important point that shortcut to a miracle makes about our influencing the universe. Well, why save it? You could have told us first. <laughs> because it is really almost incredible. It's about time. Time? What, what about it? Time seems to be relative. Meaning what? It expands or it contracts. Time expands or contracts and generally interacts with things going on around it, especially gravity. Einstein Albert Einstein, the famous physicist, showed how gravity warped what he called space-time. Wow, I have heard something about that. Mm -hmm. You notice any sort of time element in Jesus' miracles? You are of the Bible course, expert. Of course, Good. his miracles are instantaneous, yeah. outside of the natural cause of events. The waves in the storm instantly obeyed his command. Yeah. To be still. The man instantly is able to stretch forth his withered hand. The blind men he touched see instantly. The water instantly changes into wine and so forth. And to go back to Genesis, the formless universe instantly takes form when God commands it. And light instantly appears when he says, let there be light. And here's the really interesting thing. Physics shows us gravity affects time. That is to say, it slows down time. So if you live at the top of a skyscraper or at the top of a mountain, you are living at a slower rate than a person on the flats who is closer to the center of the earth. <laughs> You're joking. No, no. <laughs> of course, the difference is tiny. But you see, those people who are living in space, far away from, from Earth, higher than the skyscraper and the mountain, they are aging more slowly than people on the Earth. So if you had a twin sister who, who lived on the space station for a year, she would come back younger than you. <laughs> yeah, I, this is what 
This is what the experiments are showing. You might have heard, to become a little bit more mundane, that the GPS devices on Earth have to take the different rates of time from the devices in space into account, or we would be getting wrong information every time we used a GPS. <laughs> I should try to live in space. <laughs> yes, you would age more slowly. But, Carol, it's very expensive. What we in religious science teach, of course, is that God is outside of time. That means you can pray to God to reverse something that appears to have taken place in the past in your dimension. There's a story, for example, of the relief package that arrived in an African village on the afternoon of the day it was prayed for. With, in the care package, exactly what was needed to save the life of a little baby. The package came from the United States of America and must have been mailed three months earlier. I see what you mean. To God, everything is now. That's correct. God is outside of time. I want to end with a rather sweet romantic story from Shortcut to a Miracle to illustrate that it's never too late. Let me give you a little bit of a preamble. It is important, and I'm reading from Shortcut to a Miracle, it is important to remember the spiritual principle that we magnify and increase that which we give our attention to. Our focus needs to be on what we have and not on what we don't have. So train yourself to appreciate everything in your life that you enjoy, everything that is fulfilling and enriching. When you do this, you are attracting into your life more people things and experiences that are enjoyable, fulfilling, and enriching. The most important thing you can do while you wait is to not wait. That is to say, make a commitment to yourself to fully and, and appreciate the life that you are living currently and make your life as rewarding and fulfilling as possible. Now, Almost every couple has an interesting story about how they met. And we all know many rather incredible stories about how they got together. And one story that illustrates several important points is the story I'm about to tell you of Marcia and Ted. Marcia and Ted met when she was 19 and in college. He was a little older. 23 at the time. Marcia was very attracted to Ted. He was everything she wanted in a man. But whenever they were together in the same group, he didn't seem to be aware of her at all. And then, after a couple of years, Ted became engaged to someone else in the group, married that person, and moved to another state. Although there had never been a relationship as such between them, Marcia loved everything that she knew about Ted. One warm summer evening, a few months after Ted had moved away, Marcia sat alone on the porch outside her home. She sat in the dark for a while and thought about Ted. She recalled his many wonderful qualities and thought to herself how there, were no, there was no way that it would ever work out for the two of them now that he had gone away. Unexpectedly, however, she looked up to the sky and called out in the dark, if there is any way I can have this man, I love him and I want him. As she did this, Marcia felt a great feeling of release. She continued to sit on the porch for a while and somehow something was complete within her. Something had changed. After that night, she was able to move on with her life, free of the unfulfilled longing she had previously experienced whenever she thought about Ted. 
You see, she had spoken her re word, released it. And this also released her to get on with the business of her own life. Subsequently, Marcia graduated from college, met another fine young man, and married him. She raised a family of a son and two daughters and lived a happy and fulfilled life. Occasionally, Marcia would run into someone from the old group who made some small mention of Ted, but she didn't see him and, and they had no contact otherwise. Whenever she thought of him, she imagined him having a good life. It was 40 years after the night when Marcia had called out to the stars before she and Ted met again, 40 years. His wife had died, his children were grown, and he was moving back to the town where he and Marcia had met. She had lived there all these years, and now her husband too had died. Not surprisingly, the feeling was still there, only this time it was there too for Ted. It wasn't long before Marcia and Ted were married and their life together truly was everything she had ever dreamed it might be. In fact, Marcia confided to me, this is the author of Shortcut to a Miracle. In fact, <clears throat> when Ted was younger, he was a bit cocky and arrogant. Now all that has mellowed and I can hardly believe how lucky I am. Luck? Hardly. It was the setting of intention. And after all that, all I can say is namaste. Oh. Silence. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Reverend Michael. Thank you, Carol. If it's one thing you have learned this morning, the power of thought, the power of intention, and science backs that up. Jesus saw that 2,000 years ago, and now we are learning the power of our own thought, the power and the miracle behind our own intentions. So the story, the link with the Bible, and indeed, the conclusions from quantum physics means that as we leave this year and you're going into 2022, there's nothing to stop you. The power of thought the power of our intentions, and to know that we were created in the image and likeness of that which is creative. So, what is the lesson today? We are going to go and do likewise. Right. Thank you again.